subscribe tag tv youtube channel and press the notification button you're watching tag tv You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia. A program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Pakistan draws flag at UN virtual counter terrorism week. Elderly women killed in cross-border shelling by Pakistani troops at LOC. Taliban ramp up attacks in Afghanistan ahead of intra-Afghan negotiations. And POK activist calls out Pakistan for shedding crocodile tears on Kashmiris, urges PM to look into his own conscience. Time and again, Pakistan has been exposed at various global forums for being a terror breeder and for providing safe heaven to terrorists. The United Nations Counter-Terrorism Center launched a virtual exposition on 7th July, wherein Islamabad once again faced grave humiliation, since not only India condemned the country for being a terror sponsor, in addition to it, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres in his opening statements also highlighted the threat posed by terror groups like Al-Qaeda, Islamic State and its affiliates whose close links have often been found in Pakistan and who are waiting to leverage the ongoing pandemic situation. A report. In the UN Virtual Counter-Terrorism Week held from 6th to 10th July, Diplomats from several countries and associated groups discuss the threat posed by terrorism to world peace and harmony. At the launch of the virtual conference, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres talked about the strategic and practical challenges of countering terrorism in a global pandemic environment. Antonio, in his statement, urged the countries to closely monitor evolving terrorist threats and trends to tackle the spread of terrorist narratives through pandemic-sensitive holistic approaches. Taking an indirect jab at Pakistan, the UN chief specifically mentioned the terrorist groups active in South Asia, saying that such groups are looking forward to take inadequate advantage of the coronavirus pandemic situation. Terror groups such as the Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, and their regional affiliates must not be allowed to exploit the increasing fissures and fragilities due to the psychosocial economic and political stresses led bare by the COVID-19 pandemic, said Antonio Guterres at the launch of week-long UN Counter-Terrorism Virtual Conference. They have been reported a large number of times earlier in the United Nations and they have been reported once again uh, this time. And they have been told in no uncertain terms, which the whole world knows that they are the largest epicenter of terrorism. Taking clue from UN Chief's remarks on a spreading network of terrorism and its impact during the COVID-19 outbreak, India in its statement during the webinar emphasized upon Pakistan's unrelenting support to terrorism amidst the ongoing pandemic. Mahavir Singhvi, head of Indian delegation said that while the world is coming together to battle the pandemic, it is unfortunate that Pakistan, a state which sponsors cross-border terrorism, continues to use every opportunity to peddle false narratives and make baseless, malicious and egregious allegations against India and interfere in its internal affairs. India has rightly highlighted Pakistan's duplicitous behavior in the virtual meeting of the UN Office of Counterterrorism. Now, Pakistan continues to use terrorism as part of its state policy 
and considers the terrorist groups which it operates from its soil to be used against India as its strategic assets. It is important for the world not just to put pressure on Pakistan, but to ratchet up that pressure and impose sanctions on that country to force it to change its ways. India during the conference called on the international community to ask Pakistan to take sustained, verifiable and irreversible actions against terror outfits operating on the territory under its control. Listing out the Islamabad's role in terror attack on the Indian mission in Kabul, Mumbai terror attack of 2008, Pathan Court attack of 2016, Uri and Pulwama, the Indian delegate also hit out at Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan for his recent comments in the national parliament terming 9-11 mastermind Osama bin Laden a martyr. Imran's statement on Osama bin Laden was a chilling reminder of the patronage that the international terrorists receive in Pakistan. The fact that Taliban actually continues to operate from Pakistan, the fact that all kinds of terrorists continue, uh, the, uh, they continue to operate from Pakistan and continue to train uh, the terrorists. I mean, uh, what, what more does one need to say really? Everybody knows and the continuum of the grey list in the FATF is a clear, clear acknowledgement that Pakistan continues to support uh, uh, terrorism. So unless they bend their own ways, uh, it's going to be difficult to deal with them really in that matter. In the past, Pakistan's PM publicly acknowledged the presence of up to 40,000 terrorists in his country. Adding to the country's embarrassment, a recent report of the analytical support and sanctions monitoring team of the UN Security Council reported that around 6,500 Pakistani terrorists belonging to LET and JEM are operating in Afghanistan. Noting that it is high time for countries to take a holistic approach towards tackling the growing menace of terrorism, representatives from various international groups and countries opined that a global understanding of the counter-terrorism efforts around the world was needed. The UN Chief Secretary General stressed on the need for the international community to keep up the momentum in the fight against terrorism by investing in national, regional and global counter-terrorism capabilities, especially for countries most in need of assistance. Despite facing repeated global condemnation for its terrorist sponsoring policy, Pakistan does not stop its ill-motivated activities at line of control and in the hinterland of Jammu and Kashmir. Baffled by the killing of top terror commanders in Kashmir, Pakistani troops have once again intensified cross-border shelling at the LOC to facilitate infiltration of newly trained terrorists from its launch pads. The effective counterterrorism operations of Indian security forces in the last few weeks have led to the complete disruption of top terror network in the valley. A report. In a bid to create unrest in the Kashmir Valley, Pakistan is consistently making efforts to infiltrate terrorists into the Indian Territory. Recently, Indian Army foiled a major infiltration bid of Pakistan-backed terrorists in India's northern Rajouri district of Jammu and Kashmir. The infiltration attempt was supported by the Pakistani troops who launched unprovoked cross-border shelling along Mainthar and Barakot sectors of Punch and Rajouri region, killing an elderly woman and injuring another civilian. The deceased was identified as 60-year-old Reshma B. So, when we examined it, it was on the left leg, it was 5 into 5 cm lacerated wound with fragments of bone, it was seen from both bones. And it was also on the right thigh, it was 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 on the right thigh, but the patient bleed was on the right thigh. पल्स बीपी जो था रिकॉर्डेबल नहीं था और बाकी इसको जो अब्डामन में मल्टीपल इसको है स्प्लिंटर इंजरी है।
terrorism has always been used as proxy by Pakistan to wage a war against India and it has intensified its operation ever since New Delhi revoked the special status of Jammu and Kashmir by forcating it into two union territories. Pakistan has been hiring mercenaries and sending them across border to spread unrest. However, vigilant Indian forces have thwarted almost all of its designs in past few weeks. A significant number of infiltrators have been eliminated, while many others have been apprehended. In the latest counter-terrorism operation, Indian security forces gunned down a terrorist in an encounter in Pulwama district of Jammu and Kashmir territory. Indian Army Paramilitary Centre Reserve Police Force and Jammu and Kashmir Police had laid a cordon in the district's Gasu area on specific inputs. During the search operation, terrorist and security forces exchanged fire, leading to the killing of the terrorist in retaliatory firing by the forces. The security forces have reportedly neutralized around 138 terrorists, including top commanders like Heather of lashkar e taiba and Riyaz Naiku of Hezbollah Mujahideen during various encounters in the valley in the past six months. The action of, from the other side, especially the terrorist elements, are still active uh, and they got killed. When they get killed, it means that they were not expecting Indian uh, forces to be alert. The intelligence worked very well. The coordination is very good, and that is how you see. You have seen the last 10-15 days the number of people, the terrorists which have been killed uh, in a record number of time. Uh, that just shows that at the moment terrorists are now uh, in a state of disarray. Their command control is now getting weak. Their handlers cannot handle them well. They uh, they are under pressure in the POK area. And very soon they know India will start launching pressure on them in the POK area. And of course, as our um, the, the leaders have already made, decided that POK will have to be taken. The sharp increase in attempts of infiltration of terrorists from Pakistan and explosive attacks indicate that Pakistan has never been and will never be ready to establish peace and accord. Frustrated by its failures in unleashing mayhem in Kashmir, Islamabad has been pursuing new terror plots to attack the forces. But vigilant Indian security forces, equipped with appropriate intelligence system, have been lucratively foiling all of them. After months-long stalemate of intra-Afghan negotiations, the Afghan government and the Taliban finally agreed to initiate the long-awaited peace talks. However, the chances of peace returning to Voto Nation are still hanging on a thread as the Islamist group has not put a halt to its offensive against Afghan security forces. The violence has ramped up since the agreement and discord over the release of Taliban prisoners has hampered progress on formal talks even as the United States is trying hard to broker a peace deal between the Taliban and the Afghan government, aimed at ending the decades-long war. A report. Taliban has not put a halt to an all-out offensive on the battleground. Dozens of Afghan security forces and civilians are being killed on a daily basis. In a recent wave of violence in Afghanistan, at least 47 security personnel and 17 civilians were killed and several others were wounded. The deadliest of the all was a Taliban suicide bomb attack in the Afghan province of Kandhar, where a Taliban suicide bomber detonated an explosive-laden military vehicle on the approach to the provincial governor's residence and police headquarters. Earlier, Taliban attacks on an Afghan police convoy in southern Zabul province and the eastern province of Nangarhar also killed several police officers. As per the sources, Afghan military repelled these attacks on army checkpoints in Nangarhar province that killed at least 20 Taliban militants, including their leader. The Taliban and Afghan forces have been trading blame over the recent surge in the attacks 
across the country, even as the United States is trying hard to broker the direct peace talks between the two warring sides posing a direct threat to intra-Afghan negotiations. The Taliban's recent attacks have taken a heavy toll on Afghan forces. According to the National Security Council of Afghanistan, the Taliban group carried out 422 attacks in 32 provinces during the past month, killing 291 security personnel and wounding 550 others. Civilians too are bearing the brunt of this deadly conflict as the Security Council has accused the Taliban of carrying out 44 attacks and killing or injuring 24 civilians every day in the country since earlier this year. Consequently, Afghanistan government has termed the Taliban's commitment to reduce violence as meaningless and their actions inconsistent with their rhetoric on peace. The peace deal notwithstanding, the Taliban have been carrying out relentless attacks against the Afghan forces as well as the civilians. From 1st of March to 15th of April, they have carried out 4,500 attacks, in which over 900 Afghan forces people were killed and very many civilians were killed, and number of wounded were in terms of thousands. Under the circumstances, obviously there cannot be an effective peace deal. As far as the stance of the three parties is concerned, America is very keen that the deal will go through because Trump sees it as a ploy to win the next the November election. However, as far as Taliban is concerned, they want to maximum concessions from the Afghan government and the Americans without conceding anything in return. And as far as the Afghan government is concerned, they do not trust the Taliban as, and the Americans and they do not wish to give in easily because it will eventually mean rule over Afghanistan by Taliban. The violence has forever been a key obstacle to any negotiations between the Taliban and the Kabul government which were envisaged by the US-Taliban deal signed in the late February to end 19 years of war in Afghanistan. Standing firm against the violence by the Taliban, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani once again warned that bloodshed by the Taliban is threatening the country's peace process. Accusing the insurgent group for unleashing a wave of violence in the country, Ghani said, if the Taliban continues to fight, the Afghan peace process will face serious challenges. These accusations come as the insurgent group and the Afghan government inch closer to potential peace negotiations posing an immediate threat to upcoming intra-Afghan talks. Ashraf Ghani's statement that the violence by Taliban is a major roadblock as the peace process is concerned is very timely. In the week ending 22 June, the Taliban have killed 291 Afghan security forces, injured 522 and killed 42 civilians. With this sort of a violence, it is unlikely that the peace process can reach the conclusion. It is a very, very clear warning that as far as this sense is concerned, Afghanistan is in a very, very delicate state. The deal also called for the Afghan government to free 5,000 Taliban prisoners in exchange for the Taliban releasing 1,000 government and military personnel they hold captive. So far, the Afghan government has released more than 4,000 imprisoned insurgents while the Taliban have freed 669 Afghan security personnel. But the dispute over hundreds of Taliban prisoners has prevented the launch of intra-Afghan talks that were to have begun in March this year. Afghan authorities said they will not release around 600 Taliban captives as they are too dangerous despite planned peace talks that hinge on the prisoner exchange. Despite the disagreement, the Afghan government peace negotiating team is fully prepared 
to enter into talks with the insurgent group. However, the Taliban has said that the group will not endorse intra-Afghan talks unless the Afghan government releases its 5,000 prisoners from the jails. So far, they've released only about 3,000 prisoners. The balance, really, which the Taliban is insisting that before any further negotiation, the balance 2,000 be released is something that is holding the talks. In the meantime, Taliban attacks are continuing. Under these circumstances, I don't see much of a future as far as peace prospects in Afghanistan is concerned. Not certainly not till the American elections. Once the next American government comes into being, I'm very certain their outlook towards Taliban and Afghanistan will change. Because presently, the American interests, the interests of Afghanistan have been compromised and only the personal interest of Trump is being met. The US Taliban peace deal paves the way for withdrawing of all foreign forces from Afghanistan by the end of May 2021. However, that complete withdrawal is condition-based. That includes a Taliban guarantee that Afghan soil will not be used as a launch pad against the US and its allies, the launch of intra-Afghan negotiations and a permanent and comprehensive ceasefire in Afghanistan. The US has already reduced its crew presence to 8,600 fulfilling its obligation as part of the February deal. But the continuous surge of violence by Taliban is suggestive of the unchanged stance and strategy of the insurgent group, despite all the talks. State-sponsored human rights violations in Pakistan are no more a secret. Whether it is a Kashmiri, a Baloch, a Sindhi, or even an Ahmadiyya, his life is perennially on the edge. But Pakistani Prime Minister chooses to lecture and school other nations, surprisingly those who are run by a robust democratic framework. Recently, he took to Twitter to vent his frustration of failure at India, a neighbour his entire country has been insecure of for seven decades. As expected, there were no takers of his shallow social media rhetoric. In fact, he has been mocked and shown a mirror by Kashmiri activists who are suffering in exile due to his own government's atrocities. Tweets with a sole objective of spewing hate against Indian armed forces and Prime Minister Narendra Modi are being bombarded upon 11.8 million of Imran's Twitter followers. Having become a regular exercise, these tweets claim Jammu and Kashmir Union Territory to be under the illegal occupation of India and accuse the Indian government of violating the 4th Geneva Convention by committing war crimes and of several other atrocities committed on minorities. Busting the disinformation social media campaign of Pakistan's Prime Minister, the exiled POK activist Amjad Ayub Mirza asserted that it was Pakistan which had occupied the land of Kashmir. By narrating the dreadful accounts of history, Mirza demanded that Pakistani war crimes must be brought in front of the International Court of Justice. On October 25, Pakistan has been able to entry points Jammu Kashmir ki azad riyasat par unprovoked attack kiya tha Pakistan ka hamla kyun ghair kanuni tha isliye ki 8 July san 1947 ko Westminster mein British Parliament ne India Independence Act pass kiya tha us Independence Act ke tahat ye kaha gaya tha ki jo 560 se zayed princely states hain Hindustan mein उनको यह इजाजत है कि वो यह फैसला करें कि उन्होंने पाकिस्तान के साथ जाना है या भारत के साथ जाना है या इंडिपेंडेंट रहना है तो इसमें 
जो रियासत जम्मू कश्मीर के महाराजा थे महाराजा हरी सिंह उन्होंने मोहम्मद अली जिना के साथ एक स्टैंड स्टिल एग्रीमेंट किया था यानी जू का तू मुआदा जिसे मुआदा कायमा भी कहते हैं यानी कि हम पाकिस्तान में फिलहाल शामिल होने के होना नहीं चाहते इसको कायद अजम मोहम्मद अली जिना जिसको बोलते हैं उसने तस्लीम किया था कि ठीक है हम इस मुआदा कायमा को तस्लीम करते हैं लेकिन इसके बावजूद एक अनप्रोवोक्ट अटैक किया गया Even after committing such heinous crimes against the population of Jammu and Kashmir, Pakistan still keeps the audacity to say that it is worried about Kashmiris. Moreover, even after being aware of this fact that it was due to Pakistan's action that Maharaja Hari Singh of Jammu and Kashmir decided to join Indian Union. and signed an instrument of accession on October 26 1947 that gave control of Jammu and Kashmir to the government of India Pakistan has kept on accusing India of illegal occupation Even today while on one side it keeps on shedding its crocodile tears showing fake concerns towards the people of Jammu and Kashmir on the other it kills thousands of kashmiris every year by initiating cross border firing to achieve its own selfish agendas and with that we come to the end of this edition of news week south asia we will be back next week with more news views and analysis from the subcontinent meanwhile do keep writing to us at nwsa@nin.com this is shreya sabijay signing off on the behalf of entire production team of newsweek south asia goodbye and take care